The difference between a torque and a moment might depend on the application of the concept or even the field in which you're defining it. For example, in physics, torques are loads associated with movement or rotation, whereas moments are static loads, where no rotation occurs. Even though the units for both torques and moments are the same, with newton meters in metric and pound inches or pound feet in English units, for a mechanics of materials course, the difference lies in that the torques are affecting what you would define as the axis of the member you're analyzing. For a circular cross-section beam, cylinder, or rod, we would of course define their axis as the line resulting from all the points that are equidistant from its surface. Even though the same definition would not hold for more irregular shapes, intuitively, you could talk about the axis of a member or component, and most people would understand what you're referring to. Luckily, we usually talk about torques, twisting couples, and torsion for circular cross-section members. So if a moment is applied to the axis of the member, we call it a torque. And if a load doesn't create a moment about the axis of the member, we call it a moment. For example, if the external load shown is applied to the free end of the L-shaped structure, and we want to know what location A is subjected to, the distance x times the force P will create a moment about the z-axis, which is the axis of section AB and is therefore called a torque, not a moment. However, the distance z times the external load P will create a moment about the x-axis, and we still call it a moment m sub x if we want to label it properly. We can develop an expression for the shearing stresses by looking at a rod that is fixed at one end and subjected to a torque t at the free end. If we think of this rod as the geometry that is formed when adding disks together, we would see that the disk at the wall is not rotating, the disk at the free end is the disk that has rotated the most, and the disk somewhere along the rod is rotating an amount that is somewhere in the middle. In the same way, and regardless of the disk we look at, we would see that an infinitesimal element right at the middle would have not moved at all. An element on the surface would have moved a lot, and an element somewhere in between would have moved some percent of that. This shows us that the strain profile goes from zero to a maximum value at the surface. And since the disk itself is not deforming, only rotating due to the torque, we find that the strain profile is linear. The farther away from the center, the larger the displacement is in a directly proportional manner. Now, if you remember from the shearing strain main lecture video, link below, if we're in the elastic region of deformation, the shearing strain and the shearing stress are linearly proportional by what we call the modulus of rigidity or the shearing modulus. Therefore, the shearing stress profile is also a straight line that goes from zero to a maximum value at the surface that we call tau max. And again, this is true for any disk element we analyze. It's also true in any radial direction from the center of the disk. We will keep the r variable for any radius value between 0 and the radius of the rod, and we'll call c the radius of the rod. Since the relationship is linear between 0 and tau max, the value for tau for any radius r would be equal to r over c times tau max. If the shearing stress is defined as the shear force over area, then the force can be written as the shearing stress times the area. Remember that the torque is defined as the cross product of the force and the radius. If we look at any cross section area within the rod, the shearing stress at a distance r affecting an infinitesimal area dA multiplied by that area dA would result in the force that that dA is subjected to. With the definition of the torque, we can write that the total torque is equal to the integral of RDF for all infinitesimal forces DF within the circle, and we can substitute DF to find an expression for the torque. Since tau is a function of the area's location, or more specifically, the radius, we need to substitute tau in terms of R, C, and tau max. Tau max and C are constant because they don't vary with the radius or the area, so they can come out of the integral, and therefore our expression for tau max, the maximum shearing stress, which happens at the surface of a rod, is equal to Tc over the area integral of r squared dA. This integral is what we call the polar second moment of area, and we commonly use capital J as its variable, resulting for an expression for tau max equal to Tc over J. So now, let's take a look at that polar second moment of area. 
looking at the cross-section area from before, together with the infinitesimal element dA, we see that j can be written as two integrals. The dimensions of dA can be found if we think of one of the sites as an infinitesimal arc length dS and an infinitesimal length in the radial direction dR. Since any arc length can be found by multiplying the radius times the angle in radians, just like the circumference is the length of the whole arc of a circle, where the angle is 2 pi, dS would be an infinitesimal arc d theta times the radius to that point r. Notice that r is not an infinitesimal term here because it's only defining the distance from the center to where that dA area is located. The area of dA would therefore be r d theta times dr, and we can substitute that in the integral. For the integral to cover the whole cross-section area, and in that way account for the entire polar second moment of it, d theta would vary from 0 to 2 pi, which would cover the area of a ring, and the radius of those rings would vary from 0 to the radius of the rod c, or in this case, let's call it capital R. The first integral would just be theta evaluated from 0 to 2 pi, and the second integral would be r to the fourth over 4 evaluated from 0 to capital R. In terms of the diameter, this expression would be pi over 32 times d to the fourth. This would be the expression for the polar second moment of area for a solid rod. If we're also interested in calculating j for a hollow rod or a thick cylinder whose cross-section already looks like a thick ring that goes from inner radius to outer radius, the only difference would be the limits of the outer integral ri to ro. The evaluation of that second integral would result in an expression for j of pi over 2 times the difference of the radii to the fourth, or pi over 32 outer diameter to the fourth minus inner diameter to the fourth. With these, we have a fully defined expression to calculate the torsional shearing stress or the shearing stress due to torsion at the surface of the rod subjected to torsion, hollow or solid. We can also use this expression to calculate the shearing stress at any distance from the center with r being the value for that distance, but since we already know that the stress is highest at the surface, we will almost never use a radius value that is not the radius of the rod. For rods and shafts that are subjected to several torques along their axis, the cuts we've been performing to find internal axial forces in previous videos will also be applicable here to find internal torques. We will talk a lot more about the sub-indices we use for internal torques in the next video when we talk about the deformation caused by torsional shearing stresses, a concept we'll call the angle of twist, but for now, just know that there is a consistent way to label internal torques and that they must be followed to understand the direction of rotation of members subjected to torsion. For our very simple example from the beginning of this video, the internal torque between A and B will be labeled T sub AB if the cut is performed from A to B. If the cut is performed starting at B and going towards A, the correct label would be T sub BA. The positive or negative value of the torque will follow the general convention of positive for counterclockwise and negative for clockwise rotations, according to the axis of your frame of reference, in this case the z-axis, but again more on that in the next video. Let's take a look at a simple example where we use the shearing stress equation, the polar second moment of area expression, and the recommended use of subscripts for internal torques. If we know that each portion of the shafts A, B, B, C, and C, D consist of a solid circular rod, what is the section that is subjected to the maximum value of a shearing stress? Remember to try this problem on your own before watching the solution. In general, for problems like this, we would use the external loads information to find the shearing stresses. Finding the reaction loads, including torques and moments, is not recommended, as it is usually an extra step and therefore more time spent on unnecessary calculations. So here, we would not find the reaction torque at the wall, but for comparison purposes, we'll do it both ways. We'll start by finding the internal torques from the free end to the wall. By performing cuts between gears, we do a sum of torques to solve for the internal torque values. For each section, we can calculate the polar second moment of area using the radii values. We use these two in the shearing stress expression, together with the value for the radius in each case, to find the shearing stresses of each section. 
For now, we will not focus on the sign of those stresses, but they will be important later, both during the angle of twist video and for principal stresses and more circle much later. If we had wanted to start the analysis of this problem from the other end, the fixed end, we would have had to calculate the reaction torque at the wall first. To do this, we do a free body diagram of the rod, and if we use the sum of torques equation, knowing that the rod is not angularly accelerating, to find the reaction torque. With it, we perform the cuts, this time from the opposite end, to find the internal torques, and notice that the subscripts are reversed, and so are their signs. The magnitude of the resulting shearing stresses are the same, including the max shearing stress, and of course, the sign is also opposite, since the element subjected to that stress in the first case is located adjacent to the element on the second case, so the shearing stress vectors follow the action-reaction rules. For more examples on torsional shearing stresses and second polar moments of area, as well as the links to other Mechanics of Materials videos, make sure to check out the description of this video. Thanks for watching.